Steven Universe. It's a popular show, an influential show. Some may even say revolutionary. However, when discussing the show, there's still one point of contention that rages on to this day. Something that fans are still divided on, and likely will be for years to come. I am of course referring to <laughs> the plot itself. Yeah, throughout the years, many viewers of Steven Universe have critiqued its major plot points and story arcs. I could not keep track if I tried. On every time a new episode or a new Steven bomb came and went, and reactions to whatever story arc provided was met with some praise, but was also met with a lot of venom. I have done hundreds of theories on Steven Universe, and probably hundreds of more to come. Something that always stuck with me, even though I didn't necessarily believe it, were comments I would see now and then saying, oh my god, you should be a writer for the show. I would definitely watch your Steven Universe. Well, recently, content on how a show or movie should have ended has kind of taken off, especially after the conclusion of Game of Thrones. This got me thinking, I should do this with Steven Universe. So today, I present the first installment of what I hope to be a series, Steven Universe Rewritten. Going through a portion of the series, altering some events, and providing an alternate route for things. Coming to a similar conclusion found in the show, but with an arguably different journey. Also, before we begin, this video was a bit more expensive to produce than usual, simply because I had to commission some storyboards for things that I can't really provide footage for. Shout out to Art with Coda. So, if we can get this video to 4,000 likes, I will create a part two. You do not have to throw a like right now. You can throw it at the end of the video if you decide you did agree with everything I said, if you want to see what else I would change, but that's the requirement I'm setting for this one. It shouldn't be too hard to achieve, but YouTube really is a back and forth. Sometimes it's an uphill battle, sometimes it's smooth sailing, you never know what you're going to get. Let's also set some ground rules. One, some major story beats won't change. For example, Rose Quartz being Pink Diamond or the Diamond Redemption. Again, the routes may be altered, Steven could find out Rose's Pink Diamond through different means, but going back to those, you should be a writer on the show comments, and an alternate timeline where I was older, and a part of the crew universe, one of the head writers alongside Matt Burnett and Ben Levin. There would have been some plot points I could not have changed. Things like Rose Quartz being Pink Diamond, and I'm sure the Diamond Redemption. Pink Steven! These were all things Rebecca Sugar had outlined since day one. She clearly had an important story to tell, and Rose Quartz being Pink Diamond feeds directly into Steven's identity crisis, a plotline and message that's too important to change. What I really want to improve with Steven Universe is its cast of characters and their development, bringing the show back to its season 1 and 2 momentum, where something's always happening, where the characters are always involved, a fun series in many aspects, and yes, more action scenes. Also in my rewrite, some episodes can become half hours, I can add brand new episodes. And I do have an end goal in mind with this entire series, so if they're all a success and we get to the final episode of Steven Universe Rewritten, you'll see what I'm going for with some of the changes you'll find in here. That being said, we're going to start with Season 4, as really there isn't much, if anything, I would change about Seasons 1-3. to three. They're great, I love them. Season 4, however, is definitely the infamous season of the show. It does not have the best reputation with viewers. I think a lot of that comes from how long it took to air, alongside the abundance of episodes that really did not mean anything. Now some of these rewrites I will get in depth with. Some things I'll just briefly mention, especially if they're just in a towny episode, but I hope by the end of this, you'll take away an alternate experience and even feel a bit gratified. Maybe I gave your favorite characters some additional moments. I also want to make it clear that I'm not trying to outdo the writers. This isn't me trying to make a better version of Steven Universe, it's just me providing how I would change some things, my contributions to the story. The thing is, unlike the crew universe, I have a lot of hindsight and a lot of fan reaction on my side. So it's easier for me to quote unquote correct a story, one that not only I would enjoy, but one I think fans would enjoy as well. I do not intend any offense to the universe in this video. Who's to say? But without further ado, let's begin. Starting with The Kindergarten Kid. Now this episode on its own is fine, it's really just a homage to Looney Tunes and Roadrunner, and in that aspect, it's a harmless episode. However, this was also a season premiere, yet it really doesn't feel like one. Not because there's no major plot revelation, but because they really don't even touch on the fact that Rose Court shattered Pink Diamond, a huge revelation two episodes prior. 
I get that Bubble was a very heavy episode, and they probably wanted to begin the season with something a bit more lighthearted. So to still keep the episode fun, but engaged with its overarching story, we are going to add one moment. While trying to catch this corrupted gem, when they're at the campfire, Steven asks Peridot about Pink Diamond. If Peridot knew her at all, if she knew anything about Pink Diamond. To which Peridot's reaction is immediately flinching clearly startled. Peridot states Pink Diamond is a very touchy name back on Homeworld, and that most gems would be punished for uttering her name, especially near the diamonds. This establishes that things are still very intense on Homeworld since the birth of Era 2. This follows up with that grand revelation of Pink Diamond's fate in the previous set of episodes, which in return adds just a little bit to feel like a season premiere. Episodes that set the tone for the season, and feel a bit more grand. While this episode does focus on the aftermath of Jasper's actions, while Pink to Looney Tunes, everything with Jasper feels more like a framing device to get to the goofs, and just having a moment acknowledging the overarching story would go a long way for the viewer's experience. Beyond Kindergarten Kid, we're going to add a reference to Pink Diamond and Steven's curiosity leading up to Steven's dream. Maybe not in every episode, maybe just every other one. And yeah, those tiny episodes kind of lose their episodic feel if you add a nod to Pink Diamond. Like, in a universe where the show actually got reruns on Cartoon Network, they would probably be confused that that was the first time engaging with the show. And for that, I say, forget those people. Being confused should drive them to catch up with the show anyways. But as an example, in Future Boy Zoltron, when Garnet patches on her Future Vision to Steven to help Mr. Smiley and Mr. Frowny, Steven could briefly be tempted to use Future Vision for his own benefit. Because although Steven likes helping people, he's still a kid. He has those impulses, as we see in Steven's dream. Let's say he uses the Future Vision to peek into what would happen if he asked the gems about Pink Diamond, if he investigated, and he would get a brief glimpse of Pink Diamond's pelican, or maybe even just the illustration of it from Buddy's book. This throws Steven off his game, and adds to the discouragement he succumbs to after peering into the possibilities of Franny's responses. In Gem Harvest, while everyone's gathered around the table, and Lap has already made things a little bit awkward by addressing her passive-aggressive hostility towards the Crystal Gems, Steven's mind naturally goes towards the Gem War from here, and works up the courage to ask everyone about Pink Diamond, but is interrupted by Uncle Andy's sudden departure from the dinner, continuing the rest of the episode as normal. From here, we're going to add a brand new episode. Scavenger Hunt. Connie is continuing to read Buddy's book, hanging out with Steven when the two encounter Ronaldo. Ronaldo notices the book and falls in love with it. He's extremely invested and fascinated with the idea of history itself supporting his crazy conspiracy theories. Thus, Steven and Connie decide to take Ronaldo and embark on a worldwide scavenger hunt to find all the things in the book. Not only will this allow us to revisit some previous locations in the series and flesh them out a bit, but introduce some new ones, which any world building in Steve Universe's insane version of Earth is appreciated. Ultimately, right before they set their sights on the mysterious palanquin, the three are ambushed by a corrupted gem. However, one of the crystal gems, I think it would be clever to have it be Pearl, shows up and turns the tides in the battle, poofing said corrupted gem. Because of this, the adventure is cut short. We can assume Ronaldo had a near-death experience that he's thrilled about. Once we return to the temple and Steven and Connie talk about the book for a bit, they decide to walk away and have a jam session, ending the episode on an ominous lingering shot of the Pelican's page of Buddy's book wide open, with the diamond theme playing. This leads into Steven's dream, where we're going to have some big changes to this episode, and this is where we truly begin to rewrite the show in a significant way. First things first, this episode is going to become a double length half hour. This allows for an important subplot to be added into the episode. Steven's dream initially plays out as normal. Steven has strange dreams of Pink Diamond's Pelican, has a talk with Greg about Rose and Pink Diamond, Connie brings Buddy's book, Steven asks the gems about it, the argument ensues, but Steven doesn't go back to Greg quite yet. Steven instead pouts around the temple, thinking to himself, I just wish I had one gem in this temple who knew about Pink Diamond and would talk to me about it, which gives him an idea. Steven goes to the burning room and makes a very desperate and risky decision. He unbubbles Jasper. Of course, she's corrupted, but this is where Monster Reunion plays an even bigger role in the story. Steven has managed to bond, connect, and communicate with Credit Gems in the past thanks to Centipedal. So he does the same thing here. He unbubbles Jasper, 
applies some healing spit onto her as she reforms, which partially heals her. Steven actually uses the picture of Jasper he took in Gem Hunt to help calm her down and recognize who she is. Jasper still recognizes him as Rose Quartz, even with her mind broken, so some extra convincing is required on his end. Steven tries to jog Jasper's memory to get any kind of information he can on Pink Diamond. He recognizes closure on Pink Diamond is just as important to Jasper, if not more important than it is to Steven. He breaks out Buddy's book, and of course Jasper has a peculiar reaction to the Pelican. Just like Centipedo, Jasper tries to communicate through art, giving Steven a bit of insight into Jasper's life. However, it's reverse chronological events. We see illustration of events from Season 3, but from Jasper's perspective. We see a little bit of Jasper's takeaway of Malachite, coming to Earth with Peridot and Lapis, but then we actually see Jasper on Homeworld, loved and adored by many. But then having to deal with some, uh, rather unpleasant comments from Yellow Diamond, we see the pressures that Jasper endures. And even though it's all through illustrations, both the audience and Steven understand Jasper's pain abundantly clear. The illustrations backtrack a bit to the Gem War, and then to Pink Diamond's Pelican, where Jasper begins to have a bit of a breakdown. But before she completely reverts back into full corrupted gem, Steven decides to go to Greg for help and to take him and Jasper to Korea, bringing us to the episode's third act. The three arrive to the Pelican. Things play out as normal until they notice Blue Diamond's presence. The sight of a diamond and Pink's Pelican causes Jasper to create a bit of a stir that Steven immediately attempts to nip in the bud, but not until getting the attention of Blue Pearl. Greg still decides to take one for the team and approach Blue Diamond. They talk, he gets kidnapped, Steven fails to save him, Garnet comes to the rescue, poops Jasper, and we're going to space, baby. Now, Jasper's inclusion in the episode is to pretty much give more insight into how she is as a character and the gem war. Steven goes in to get information on Pink Diamond, but ends up having a different takeaway entirely. We never really got to see the pressures that Jasper endured, the complex side of her. And for Steven to see that, even though Jasper served Pink Diamond, she really does not know that much more about her than Steven himself. Many of you may be aware that I'm a huge fan of Jasper, and yeah, her just kind of being written out of the show until the end of Change Your Mind, it rubbed me the wrong way. So although there may not be much room for her to play a bigger part in the story, just having her return shortly after she's corrupted, giving a bit more closure to her character for the moment, I think it'll mean something to the viewers and especially her hardcore fans. But let's move on to Adventures in Light Distortion. The beginning of the episode plays out the same. Greg's kidnapped. Wait, are Greg? Oh no, he must be at the zoo. Let's take the roaming eye. But after figuring out they can take the roaming eye to the zoo, we have another major change to this arc. Peridot, Lapis, and Connie are not staying behind in Beach City. They're coming along to the zoo. What causes this major change is that when Peridot expects the roaming eye, she discovers a pair of lemon hancers. It makes sense. These ships are not exclusive to rubies, as we see later in the episode with the various size calibrations and the plenty of roaming eyes we see later at the zoo. So why wouldn't they include something as simple as lemon hancers for era 2 gems if they're newer ships? Peridot believes she can provide assistance to the zoo if any tech has been altered since Pearl was last present there. This is also very important for Lapis as it fleshes out her decision to leave later on, making it much more compelling. The thing about about Lapis when she leaves the show itself is that she left with zero gem missions and keeping herself in the barn all day. While I get that may be the point of her character's behavior, it also kind of flates her later explained thought process and feelings towards Earth. That she had a new home on the planet that she values, with people she values that she does want to be a part of the Crystal Gems. Also, a part of her involvement in the new Crystal Gems is her masquerading as Amethyst. If she at least got to be a part of one gem mission that saw her directly interact with Homeworld as someone on the other side and seeing the mission nearly fail, especially one that involved the diamond showing up, it would drive her closer to leaving than staying. The new Crystal Gems will still happen, but the events of this rewritten arc will greatly change the motivations for Connie, Lapis, and Peridot to try and fulfill Crystal Gem duty on Earth. Aside from Peridot, Lapis, and Connie though, the episode plays out as normal. They venture into space, hit hyperspeed, Steven has a breakdown, although this time Connie would be by his side to attempt to eat his mind, although it would be kind of hard because of the velocity of the ship, and when everything calms down, they arrive at the zoo. So here we are. The meat of this arc begins to alter. When they arrive to the zoo and see the Amethyst Guards, Garnet unfuses. 
Peridot Don some lemon enhancers, Amethyst ship shapes into a quote unquote proper size, Lapis is Lapis, she's the safest bet out of all of them. However, one thing about this arc always bothered me. Pearl is just blatantly wearing a star, the symbol of the Crystal Gems, and never gets called out for it. So we're going to make one simple change. She puts on her space suit, maybe change the diamond so it's yellow or blue instead of pink. As for Steven and Connie, well, it's obvious what we're going to do with them, but it won't happen yet. Although Connie obviously leaves with a sword in the ship. The disguised Crystal Gems approach the Amethyst, meet Holly Blue Agate, and the tour of the zoo is underway. During the tour, Peridot remarked she didn't realize how much he missed Lemon Answers, doing all sorts of neat things with them until it's time for the gang to come up with a distraction. Of course, Ruby's excuse is related to the ship, which removes Peridot from Steven, Lapis, Ruby, and Pearl, as Holly Blue assumes that this would be Peridot's area of expertise, which isn't wrong, so Pearl is still unable to open the door. However, Lapis thinks of a plan that also gives her and Peridot a role in this arc. Once Holly Blue, Peridot, and Sapphire return, Lapis claims to Holly Blue that Blue Diamond sent her and Peridot along with the rest of the gems to provide maintenance to the zoo itself. Lapis Lazulis are meant to terraform, and Peridot seem to work with homeworld tech in general. This excuse works well enough for Holly Blue Agate to send Peridot and Lapis into the zoo ahead of Steven and Connie. The rest of the episode plays out as normal, Steven is sent inside the zoo, this time Connie is sent ahead of them, considering the zoo undressed their subjects prior, and it would be awkward to see any of that info on Connie's behalf to say the least. Steven and Connie land in the human area of the zoo and spot Greg. The zoo. Now in the zoo itself and reunited with Greg, Steven and Connie decide it'll be easier and safer if they just fuse into Stevani. Less of a risk of being separated, her in danger, etc. I just think it's important that Greg and Steven reunite with Steven as himself first. Stevani informs Greg there's a door they can escape through, as Peridot and Lapis catch up with the three, stating they're not sure on how they're supposed to perform maintenance in the zoo, but they've been making some meat mores of all the plants and water. Something fancy. However, they know it's smart to play it safe and just watch Stevani and Greg from afar while they pretend to improve the zoo with quality art. Greg gets Stevani acquainted with the zoomins, and we experience most of the episodes normal with Stevani's blatant discomfort towards the utopian paradise. After all, it's exactly what it's named. A human zoo. They have no freedom, no independence. With Stevani in place of Steven, I feel like Connie's have the fusion would bring out more vocal concern and analytical dissection. Concerns they would voice to the zoomins, only to be met with playful, childish answers that help illustrate how brainwashed and conditioned these prisoners are. As the day turns into night and everyone begins to go to sleep, Greg and Stevani link up with Peridot and Lapis to open the door. But before Peridot can unlock the door, they attract the attention of Y6 and J10. Side note, I just realized that J10 is J Jaden, you know, a, a regular name. That's pretty cool, you know? Which of course startles Peridot and Lapis. J10 explains the door has only opened once, where a gem came to aid a human that was hurt. This isn't a story he simply relays to them, but he actually shows them a mural on the wall. Lapis, still able to see and view Stevani, assumes the gem in question is Rose Quartz, due to Steven's own healing ability. But as we get to see a good look at the mural, we discover the gem in question, who healed a zoom in, was none other than the silhouette of Pink Diamond. Planting some somewhat on the nose foreshadowing that Rose Quartz is Pink Diamond. Yet, it's only on the nose because of hindsight. But imagine the time of premiere. People would have been divided, either assuming Rose is Pink Diamond or that the two share the same powers. Since Steven doesn't know what Pink Diamond exactly looks like, however, and the mural is only straightforward to Lapis and the viewers, Stevani simply assumes the gem will emerge if they stage an incident. Unfortunately, after knocking the win out of Greg, no gem comes to the call. From here, the choosing occurs. Everyone wants Greg, he doesn't want any of them, the Zoomins have a mental breakdown, the Amethyst blood in, Peridot tries to fight them to protect Stevani and Greg. Yes, we get a fight scene. Yet, it's not just fan service. Again, I want most of these changes to advance and add development to the characters. Because while Peridot is fighting, Lapis is paralyzed with fear at the thought of the mission blowing up in their faces and fighting back to no avail. She finally decides to help, and we see her forming a giant fist from the waterfall. But she is immediately restrained by an amethyst off guard. Peridot is also overwhelmed. Her lemon enhancer is taking damage. Stevani, Greg, Peridot, 
and Lapis are captured by the Amethyst guards. Which brings us to that will be all. Stevani, Greg, Paradai, and Lapis are taken to the housing unit for the other Amethyst. Steven and Connie unfusing as they hit the ground. Amethyst sets them up to believe she was caught, only to reveal she was faking it the entire time, and has befriended the Amethyst. Truthfully, most of this episode goes unaffected. Holly Blue Agate runs in and informs the Amethyst Blue Diamond is on the way, though she assumes Paradai and Lapis were being distracted by the Amethyst and apologizes. Greg, Steven, and Connie run behind the other Amethyst and run into Pink Diamond's room that contains all of the Bubbled Rose corpses. Blue and Yellow Diamond enter the room. Yellow tries to push Blue to move on. She sings what's used to feeling blue. She gets upset. Ruby, Sapphire, and this time Lapis enter the room of Holly Blue Agate. Blue Diamond actually remarks how happy she is to see a Lapis, as their high ranking gems are always loyal and valued. Sapphire lies to Blue Diamond enough to convince both Diamonds that Blue really does long for more humans, to which Yellow inquires about the cluster, learns it'll merge soon, and remarks, then there's still time. That will be all. On everyone's way out, Holly Blue has her spiel and notices the gems are trying to smoke out three humans. Holly removes her whip and instead of Ruby and Sapphire refusing into Garnet and intercepting the whip, Peridot, Lapis, and Connie, who was able to grab Rose's sword from the ship while Holly Blue prepared her whip, all make an attempt to take on Holly Blue. It's more of a coincidence all three spring into action instead of planned, except it is planned from a writer's standpoint for the new Crystal Gems. Their fight with Holly Blue is a bit sloppy, and in this brief confrontation, Holly actually taunts that Paradai is nothing without her limb enhancers, swinging her whip at Paradai and completely destroying half of the enhancers. Paradot doesn't sweat it though, boasting she's great the way she is with or without enhancers, using her metal powers to bonk Holly Blue with the remains of the destroyed components. Holly, furious, attempts to swing her whip again, and from there, Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl finish the job, tying her up. Pearl and Steven intimidate Holly into keeping her mouth shut, Amethyst parts away with the Famethyst, and the gang is able to escape. Peridot, Lapis, and Connie are feeling a bit embarrassed in their involvement, screwing up the battle. That if Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl immediately took care of it, Peridot's limit answers would not have been destroyed in the first place. Although Peridot isn't too upset about it. If anything, she thinks she can use the limit answers to make something cooler out of them. Plot point. Steven and Greg have their emotional chat, and the voyage to Beach City begins. However, the new Crystal Gems won't be the immediate next episode. Oh no, there's something we gotta take care of. Something Steven would get on their way home. But let's save that for next time. I know this first episode didn't greatly rewrite everything, but I hope you guys can kind of pick up on some of the seeds I planted throughout the video for future character development that I want to flesh out in these upcoming parts. Now the next episode will probably focus on the second half of season 2, I do have some rewriting planned for there, and then episode 3 will probably focus on the first half of season 5, and the rest I won't give away. But you have a good idea of how much content I'm going to cover each episode. As always though, I want to hear your thoughts. Do you like my rewrites? Do you disagree? If anything, where do you think it could go? All feedback is good feedback. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at RoundtableVids. And for more of my own thoughts, you can find me at Austric Vox. We're also on Instagram. And again, special thanks to Art with Coda for not just the thumbnail, but all the storyboards he contributed to this as well. You can find him on Tumblr, Instagram, and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Link in the description. Help the Roundtable grow by either becoming a member of this channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please order a like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Ostrich Vox, signing out.